it was more than a hockey game. It was us against them. It was freedom versus communism. Nobody gave us a hope in Halloween. It was a sliver of the Cold War played out on a sheet of ice. Here you have a bunch of fresh-faced college kids taking on the big, bad Soviet bear in the United States, in the Olympics. The confluence of events was so extraordinary, it can never happen again. Nobody paid attention to what Americans said in the world anymore. Our hostages had been taken, and we couldn't get them back. The Red Army went into Afghanistan. We couldn't get them out. It might have been the all-time low point for American public self-esteem. Who knew that these kids would become the vehicle for making people feel excited and proud again to wave a flag? It was a miracle. David slew Goliath. It was the greatest sports moment of the 20th century. America. For many, it is a word that conjures up images of a land of miracles where anything is possible. But that's not how it was in much of the 1970s, when a darkness seemed to hang over the nation. There was Kent State, and final defeat in Vietnam. There was Watergate, and Three Mile Island. There were long lines at the gas station, exorbitant interest rates at the bank, and at the end of the decade, an overwhelming image signifying just how powerless we'd become. No one could know that it would be, of all things, a hockey game, played by 20 American kids, filled with optimism and determination that would rejuvenate the American spirit and become a symbol of national pride. No one could know how important one game could possibly be to a nation that seemed to be losing its way. Certainly not in 1979, when a weary America heard from its embattled leader, who told us we were a nation in crisis. It is a crisis of confidence. It is a crisis that strikes at the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. President Carter was seen as a, an expression of the American self-doubt and lack of self-confidence of the mid-70s. Our public support was eroding rapidly. You could feel it when you're out with people, when you're giving speeches, when you're shaking hands. America, I think, had begun to wonder whether we'd lost our edge. At the end of the 70s, American amateur hockey was suffering the same malaise as the nation itself. In the 20 years since winning the gold medal at the 1960 Olympics, American teams had become increasingly unable to compete with the dominant Europeans, especially the Soviet Union, whose players were amateurs in name only. The Americans were always amateurs, college kids, some of them, or recent graduates who still played the game, but certainly not at the, the Russian level. There was no way that they could be competitive. And the feeling going into 1980 was they really haven't got much of a chance, even though it's here in Lake Placid. The goal was to avoid being embarrassed at home. So in July of 1979, the best amateur players in the country were invited to try out for the 1980 Olympic team. They invited us all to Colorado Springs and they divided us up into four teams. Basically, Eastern guys, Michigan guys, Minnesota guys, and an at-large team. Over the course of 10 days in Colorado Springs, those four teams played a round robin. It was a nerve-wracking situation. It was a pressure-packed situation. And as that tournament went on, it was being evaluated by Herb Brooks. Mike, heads up, Mike. Herb Brooks never went to charm school. Get it off, get it off, quick. If he had, he would have flunked out. How would you call it a hook on that stand? It was abrasive. There's two teams playing this thing, stand. Intense. Right, JC hooked him, get in that game now, will ya? He was also the best college hockey coach in the country. People were a little afraid of him. 
He had always been considered kind of an outsider, had his own way of thinking, his own way of doing things. And he had a history with the Olympic team. As a University of Minnesota player, Brooks thought he had made the team in 1960. He was even in the team picture. But at the last minute, coach Jack Riley added a new player to the roster, and someone had to go. The someone was Herb Brooks, cut just one day before the team left for the games. Back home in Minnesota, Brooks watched with his father as his old teammates beat Czechoslovakia and won America's first gold medal in ice hockey. When we won it, my father looked over and says, well, looks like Coach Riley cut the right guy, didn't he? So, a uh, true story, and I, you know, it sort of hit me right between the eyes. That left unfinished business in Herb Brooks' life. He had something to prove. He was on a mission. A mission to shake American hockey out of its slumber. First, Brooks had to trim the roster from 80 to 26. So he began by keeping the players he knew best, ones who had helped him win three NCAA championships at the University of Minnesota in the 70s. They included Mike Ramsey and Bill Baker, Neil Broughton and Rob McClanahan, Eric Strobel and Buzz Schneider. But Brooks knew he couldn't be provincial. Herb wanted to make sure that it didn't look like a Minnesota team because he was from Minnesota. He wanted to make sure there was a good balance. So Brooks looked eastward to another college hockey powerhouse, Boston University, where he got Jack O'Callaghan, a defenseman with an attitude, and Michael Ruzioni, whose name in Italian means eruption, perfectly fitting his personality. To fill the most important role, Brooks picked 22-year-old Jim Craig, who'd been playing goaltender since he began skating on the frozen ponds of New England. I started to play goal because I didn't know the rules. And I figured, you know, it's not too hard. He's just supposed to keep that puck out of the net. He kept the puck out of the net as well as any amateur goaltender around, but spent his college years playing with a broken heart, following the death of his mother, Margaret, from cancer. His father, Donald, took the loss extremely hard. I think when my mother passed away, a piece of my father left. He was so lost. He was a shell of himself. I, I think death and the tragedy of that brought us really, really close together. I spent a lot of time with Jimmy and talked to Jimmy an awful lot. Jimmy was the guy in my mind that I thought we had to put the saddle on. Brooks filled out the team with gritty players like Mark Johnson from the University of Wisconsin, John Harrington and Mark Pavlich from Minnesota Duluth, Kenny Morrow from Bowling Green, and tapped others, mostly from colleges in the upper Midwest. They were tough and fast and disciplined, but compared to the world's best, the players who were called amateurs, but in reality played hockey for a living, the Americans were just a bunch of kids, not feared and not respected. We were by far the youngest, most inexperienced team when it came to the Olympic Games. We were just college kids playing flat out, professional, older, stronger, better you know, athletes, so it was a real formidable task. Behind the Iron Curtain, Another intense coach was preparing his team for Lake Placid. But Viktor Tikhonov didn't have any of Herb Brooks's problems. The Soviets were the best hockey team in the world, and everybody knew it. So Tikhonov's goal was simple, to return home to Moscow with his nation's fifth straight Olympic hockey gold medal. That his own players despised him meant nothing. I would say he was a fanatic, thinking of hockey 24 hours per day. He wanted that the Soviet Union or Russia will be number one everywhere and anywhere. And he wanted that every player who plays for him will think the same way. The players hated him big time. The life was intense, practically without family, children or hobbies. It was only work. Vladislav Tretiak grew up just outside of Moscow and became immersed in the Soviet sports machine at a young age. He developed into perhaps the greatest goaltender to ever play and starred on the Soviet national team for over 15 years. We lived in camps for nine months out of the year. We trained, studied theory and practiced three times a day. It was a difficult and harsh life. I saw my wife and children rarely. But the thing is, I loved hockey very much. I thought that's the way it should be and I was ready to sacrifice and put discipline ahead of everything in order to be first and for my team to win. Tretiak and his teammates were first, year after year. 
their lives and careers were controlled by the Soviet government, because technically, they were soldiers in the Red Army, but only technically. I went from a private to lieutenant colonel, but didn't do any army stuff. For the most part, we were fully devoted to hockey. By 1980, Boris Mikhailov was already a 10-year veteran of the Soviet national team and the most recognizable face in international hockey. Sport was tied with politics, and any victory had big political undertones, especially during the Olympic Games, when the general secretary and everybody else was worried about how we would represent our country. Our test was only to place first. Mikhailov and his teammates represented the Soviet Union by demolishing just about anyone who got in their way. They were government-sponsored magicians on ice who had been dominating international hockey since the darkest days of the Cold War. It was a dynasty, definitely, for 10, 20, 30 years. Their main goal was to win in every game, every period, every shift. It was one regular season when they won 43 out of 44 games. 64, 68, 72, 76, right up until 1980, the Soviets were unbeatable in the Olympics. They played hockey the way we played basketball, with the same kind of control of the puck, the same kind of intricate offensive patterns, and of course the presence and goal of Tretiak. How could you beat him? Back in the U.S., Herb Brooks had been contemplating that same question for years. They could execute at such a high level of speed, skating, passing, shooting, thinking. I tried to develop a team that would throw their game right back at them. But first, Brooks would have to get his players to start thinking as a team, which wouldn't be easy. The rivalry between the University of Minnesota and Boston University was one of the fiercest in all of college hockey. And regional tensions between many of the new teammates ran high. As much as I was a Boston hockey player and I had pride in my roots as a Boston hockey player, I had an enemy, and my enemy was the University of Minnesota. There was a huge difference, I think, between the, the guys from out east and the guys from out west. You know, they'd come in with their fancy clothes and talking trash, and, and there's us guys, you know, we're just kind of, you know, got a little bit different outlook on everything. And the Boston guys, you know, we thought we were pretty savvy, and, you know, there were guys that didn't lock their doors or left their wallets out in plain sight. We thought, you know, these guys are a bunch of hicks from the cow pastures. I wanted to blur the, the boundaries of our country, build a we and an us and ourselves as opposed to an I, me, myself. Our spirit was going to be a big asset, and you can't have that type of thing if you have pockets of individuals and if there's not those team-building exercises throughout the year. Starting in August of 79, Brooks began employing his main team-building exercise beginning a rugged six-month pre-Olympic training program with a strategy. To bond them as a team, his players needed one common enemy, him. Herb always liked that, where it would be you against him. You know, he was the bad guy. He liked being in that bad guy role. I remember when he told us, I'll be a coach, but I won't be a friend. And I'm like, wow, this is going to be a long year. Herbie threw compliments around like manhole covers. He quoted in the paper that I had a million dollar set of legs and a 10 cent fart for a brain. He could give you that glare and that look and it's like, oh my God, what did I do wrong now? I can honestly say that uh, there was no sense of regionalism on that team. There was a sense of Herbieism. And if Herbieism had a language, it could be found in a tiny notebook the players secretly kept, documenting each moment their coach began to sound like a cross between Yogi Berra and Casey Stengel. The players called his strange motivational sayings, Brooksisms. A couple of my favorite Brooksisms on our team, you don't have enough talent to win on talent alone. There's a fine line between guts and brains. You look like a monkey screwing a football, whatever that meant, I'm not sure. Ramsey, you're playing, you're playing worse and worse every day, and right now you're playing like it's next week. Harrington, you're playing worse every day, and right now you're playing like the middle of next month. Christoph, you suck. You know, you're getting worse every day, and today you're playing like next month. I mean, that was a, that was a tip for but he was right. And his strategy was working. Herb Brooks was transforming them into a team. Our Olympic team got very tight with the idea that it was us versus him. And we're constantly, as a group, trying to prove to him that we're good enough to play. It was Herbie bashing from day one until the final day of the Olympics. It, it really made them a unit. As September arrived, it was time to start playing against future Olympic competition. 
so Brooks took the team to Europe for a series of exhibition games. The Americans started out strong, winning six of their first eight, but Brooks kept pressing. Before a game against Norway, a team they would have to face at the Olympics, he issued a challenge. I said, guys, we're going to have to play the Norwegians in qualifications. So we do it tonight. We send the message right now. But playing flat and uninspired hockey, the U.S. could only muster a 3-3 tie, and Brooks was furious. As we went to get off the ice, Herbie ran from the bench down to the gate and said, stay out on the ice. Steam's coming out of his ears. He's so hot that we had tied Norway, which was the weakest team we had played over there. If that's all we can do is tie the Norway national team 3-3, and you think you're going to go to the Olympics and be successful, you got another guest coming. He's standing there with his suit on, and he makes us all get behind the net and on the goal line, and he starts blowing his whistle. And we did what are called Herbies, which are blue line back, red line back, far blue line back, all the way down and back. Two or three of those would be tiring. Blue line back, red line back, blue line back, down and back. Ten or twelve of them would be excessive. <laughs> and we did them for about 45 minutes to an hour. The rink attendant turned the lights off on us and we still skated in the dark. In the dark, he's screaming at us. Booming voice around this empty arena. It was pretty intense. The message went out right then. They're not going to play the game like that and disgrace their abilities or our collective efforts. No one knows exactly how many Herbies were done that night, but to the players, it was a turning point. That moment probably had more to do with us gelling as a team, feeling like we were a group, a family. We looked at each other and said, you know, basically he can do anything he wants to us. He's not going to break us. Returning from Europe, the team continued its grueling schedule of competition in the United States, and they went on a tear, winning 30 of their 41 games through the fall of 1979. Around Christmas time, we played in a pre-Olympic tournament in Lake Placid. We played the Russian national B team, who were pretty darn good. And the Americans beat the Soviet junior varsity team 5-3, to three, winning the tournament and gold medals to go with it. But the smiles on their faces hit an uneasy feeling on the team, because despite all the wins, Herb Brooks wasn't satisfied. I didn't like our, our team then. I didn't like the, the chemistry of our team. And since only 20 players were allowed on the Olympic roster, there were still six cuts to come. Brooks was making it clear that no one was safe, not even the team captain. Two weeks before the Olympic Games, he calls me in. He's going to cut me from the team. You're not good enough. You shouldn't be here. I never should have taken you. I'm going to send you back. And I'm thinking, he might just do this. <laughs> you know, I'm like, wow. The word got down that Aruzioni's job was in jeopardy. Everyone said, if he'll cut the captain, where do I stand? Which was exactly what Brooks wanted. Turning the screws even tighter, he was bringing in new players for tryouts just weeks before the Olympics, provoking the same fear in his players that Brooks himself experienced in 1960, when he was cut from the Olympic team at the last minute. But this was a new generation of player, and they'd had enough. And I said, you know, Herb, I don't think you should do it. I think it's wrong. We're going to Lake Placid in a week. I mean, stop it. Get rid of these guys and let us get serious about this. And I was looking for that moment where their cohesiveness and strength of association was such a strong bond, and then I would just cut the cord. And that was the moment. Brooks sent the late additions back home. He trimmed the roster to 20 and kept his captain. Kurt never did anything on a whim. He planned. And I think he felt like that maybe this was the last test to see how close these players really are. I'm sure Herbie walked away from that and said, you know, maybe we got a shot. The team was finally set, and their confidence was building thanks to an outstanding 42-15-3 record against world-class competition. But before the Olympics, the Americans had one more test to take. On February 9, 1980, at Madison Square Garden in New York City, they skated onto the ice to play a fundraising exhibition game, just three days before the start of the Olympics. But to their opponents on this night, it wasn't just an exhibition. Because any time the Soviet Union's top team played against Americans, they played to win. The Soviets had just recently embarrassed the NHL All-Stars in a three-game series, winning the Challenge Cup on American ice. With the Olympics only days away, they were rolling over opponents 
like a red tidal wave. They were the Red Menace, and they wore the CCCP across their chests, and they were very, very intimidating. You had heard about them, you'd known how good they were, you'd known about their successes, and now you were gonna play them. And that night it was, welcome to the real world, boys. We got crushed, and we thought, these guys are in another world. They just kicked us around that rink. The goals they scored were, you could have filmed them, they were so beautiful. They were like robots. When they scored a goal, they never smiled. I don't think I ever saw them smile. We were all ready to stand up and applaud them, because we didn't see anything like that before. The guy's hitting elbow, did you see that goal? Did you see his move? It's like, we were spectators. I looked up at the scoreboard, it said 10 to three. It might as well have said 20 to nothing. 10-3 made it sound closer than it was. It was no contest. There couldn't have been a greater low point given the preparation and the, and the work that we had put in. It was very demoralizing. This dose of hockey reality brought U.S. hopes back to earth. As each team left New York City for upstate Lake Placid, their futures seemed clear. Anybody who left Madison Square Garden that day thought to themselves, the Soviets will win every game in the Olympics, take home the gold medal, and never be challenged. In the U.S., all you knew is that when it came time to face the Big Bear, they had no chance. As discouraging as the loss to the Soviets was, it was not something heavy on the minds of Americans. Throughout 1979, as the hockey team was preparing to compete in the Olympics, Americans at large were also competing with the harsh realities of everyday life. Look at the economy. Look how much money we're paying for gas. Inflation was absolutely ridiculous. People just didn't feel good about the United States. A lot of people wondered where we were headed. And then in November, just when things seemed like they couldn't get worse. This is NBC Nightly News. They did. With Jessica Savage. Good evening. The American embassy in Tehran is in the hands of Muslim students tonight. Spurred on by an anti-American speech by the Ayatollah Khomeini, they stormed the embassy and took dozens of American hostages. On November 4th, which was a really rainy day, 100 or so Iranian students climbed over the walls of the U.S. Embassy, yelling, Magba America, death to America. In a few seconds, uh, the door was knocked down, and Iranians with automatic weapons uh, stood right in front of me and uh, held them against my head. This morning, for the first time since the hostages were put under lock and key, one of the captives, blindfolded, was brought out into the open. This is Harry Rosen, the embassy's press attaché. Barry Rosen and 51 other Americans would be held hostage in Iran for the next 444 days. We were bound hand and foot with guards in our room, weren't permitted to speak at all. You do not see a day of sunlight they would come into our cells and hold us up against the wall and use an automatic weapon and count from 10 to 1 just to scare us. The defining moment of the late 70s for Americans was the hostage crisis in Iran. Here we couldn't do anything to